studying the curse that's found in Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 through 19. And as I've mentioned several times, even though we refer to this passage as the curse singular, in reality there are several curses involved, not just one. You have the curse on the animal kingdom, the curse on the serpent, the curse on the woman, the curse on Adam and his descendants, and the curse on the earth itself. So there's not just one curse, but there are several curses affecting just about everything and everyone. And we want to look at each one of the curses individually. Now, so far we've covered the curse on the animal kingdom, the curse on the serpent, and we've covered what scholars refer to as seed theology. And you really don't understand the New Testament if you don't understand the concept of seed theology. So we took a little bit of time off and, and kind of went in that direction for a while. Well, tonight we're going to cover the curse on the woman. And if we have time, we're going to cover the curse on Adam and his descendants and the curse that's placed on the earth. Now, I'll be honest with you, I doubt very seriously that we're going to have time to do that. But we're going to try so turn with me, if you would, to the book of Genesis 3.16, and let's look at the curse that was placed upon the woman. To the woman he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Now I want you to notice the pronouns he and I. To the woman he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. Now, who does he and I refer to? Well, of course, God. To the woman, God said, I, God, will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. Now, one of the great debates among scholars is whether the church, the, the curse in Genesis chapter 3 is being prescribed or described. In other words, is God placing this curse upon the woman or is he merely informing her of what's going to happen as the result of her sin? Now, does everyone understand what I'm saying? Because this is very important. I want to make sure you understand what I'm saying. So let me say this in a different way. In case you didn't grasp it that way, you can grasp it this other way. There is a big debate among two groups of scholars. One group believes that God specifically and intentionally placed this curse upon women because of Eve's sin. It didn't have to happen that way, but God chose to place this curse upon women as a punishment for Eve's sin. It was prescribed. The other group believes that this curse on women is simply a natural consequence of sin. And what God is doing is informing Eve of what's going to happen now that she's allowed sin into the world. And he's doing so with a heavy heart. It's not because he wants to do this. In a sense, he's coming to Eve and he's saying, you don't understand what you've done. Because of what you've done, this is going to happen. Now, does everyone understand the two different positions? The first believes that God is prescribing the curse. The second believes that God is simply describing the curse. Sounds the same, different, and I hope you understand that. Because if you don't, then you're going to kind of be lost in where we're going. Now, let me explain why this is so important. These two groups represent two different perspectives of God. The first group views God as strict and vindictive. He's quick to punish, and his punishment is severe. Adam and Eve stepped out of line, and God was quick to punish them and to punish them severely. The second group views God as more loving, more merciful, and more compassionate. Yes, he punishes, but he's just, and that's why he punishes us. And he does it because he loves us. But when he does it, he does it with a heavy heart and with our best interest in mind. Now, as you probably guessed, the vast majority of scholars in the first group are Calvinist. Now, I know sometimes that people think that I pick on Calvinist, but I don't. I'm basically stating facts. Calvinists believe that God prescribed this curse. Why? Because they believe that nothing happens that isn't God's will. Let me quote from Edwin Palmer's book, The Five Points of Calvinism. This is kind of the book that if you go to seminary and you take a class on Calvinism, this is the book that you will use. All right? He is a Calvinist. He's laying out the five points of Calvinism. Tulip, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. 
And he lays it out in a very logical order. And I'm just going to quote from him. It's on page 25 if you want to buy the book. Here's what he writes. Nothing in this world happens by chance. Nothing. God is in back of everything. He decides and causes all things to happen that do happen. He has ordained everything after the counsel of his will. The moving of a finger, the beating of a heart, the laughter of a girl, the mistake of a typist, even sin. In other words, everything that happens is God's will. Even sin. He caused it to happen. Wow. But that's what five-point Calvinists believe. Someone gets raped, it's God's will. In fact, God caused it to happen. If someone gets murdered, it's God's will. In fact, he caused it to happen. And that's why you hear, even though they won't say it publicly in their sermons, but you hear it in a roundabout way. This is why you hear pastors say at funerals, we don't know why God chose to take this young man. But we just have to trust him. They say that because they believe that nothing happens that is not God's will. He causes everything that happens to happen. Now, because of their belief that nothing happens that's not God's will, they believe that God is prescribing the curse upon the woman in verse 16. In other words, God chose to place this curse upon women. He didn't have to, but he chose to. Two, so now it's his will for women to have difficulty in childbearing. It's his will for men to rule over their wife and women in general. And you will see a lot of denominations, you'll see a lot of religious groups where the man is the man. Do you know what I'm talking about? He is the man. Woman, shut up. I'll tell you how much you can spend. I'll tell you if you can work in the house or if you can't work in the house. I'll tell you if I want you to cut your hair or not cut your hair. Now, where are they getting that? Now, I'm not saying that they're Calvinists. What I'm saying, though, is they believe, Genesis chapter 3, verse number 16, God is prescribing the curse. It didn't have to go down that way. It's simply that God chose for it to go down that way. And what he was telling women is because of what Eve has done, now man will rule over you. So men come and they say, wait a minute, that's God's will. God chose for men to rule over. And they go back to the Hebrew word for rule and say, that's what God wants. Does that make sense? And they point to the two pronouns in verse number 16, he and I, and they say, see, God is the one who placed this curse upon women. So it's his will for these things to happen. Now the majority of the second group is comprised of Arminians. They believe that God is simply describing what's going to happen to women as a result of sin being in the world, as a result of sin being allowed in the world through what Eve did. So how does this group explain the two personal pronouns in verse 16? Look at verse number 16 again. To the woman, he said, who's he? God. To the woman, God said, I, I, God, will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Well, Arminians believe that the reason this to, the two personal pronouns are used is because God is ultimately responsible for making the decision to allow sin to run its course in this world until it's finally conquered by the Messiah. But that does not mean that everything that happens is now God's will or that God caused it to happen. No. God allowing something to happen is not the same thing as God willing something to happen. And God allowing something to happen is not the same thing as God causing something to happen. How many of you know what I'm talking about? My girls have gotten to an age that they're adults. They have the ability to choose certain things. But many times I still help financially. Now, my, older, my oldest one is now married and I, I really don't do that. But my youngest one is still needing financial assistance from me. And so you know the old rule of thumb. If they're under my house, they're under my rules. Yeah. Now, 
What's kind of interesting though, because of the age that she is, she's to that point where she needs to be making decisions. And I allow her to make decisions, but it doesn't mean that every decision she makes is my will. Does that make sense? So God allowing something to happen is not the same thing as God willing something to happen. And God allowing something to happen is not the same thing as God causing something to happen. And that is erroneous philosophy and logic if you think it's not that case. Does that make sense? So the reason the two personal pronouns are used is to designate that God is responsible for allowing the consequence of Adam and Eve's sin to play out in the world. Now, we're not going to get into it, but God really didn't have any other choice because God is just. And if you're just, it means that sin will be punished and righteousness will be rewarded. And had God chose to punish sin immediately instead of allowing it to run its course, then Adam and Eve would have had immediate death and the world would not have uh, been able to multiply. There wouldn't have been any redemption. He would have just eliminated sin right away, said everything right again. But because God is not only just but merciful, he says sin will be punished. I'm going to allow sin to run its course, but it's going to be punished through the Savior Jesus Christ. And through Jesus Christ, sin will be condemned in the flesh, and we will conquer sin, and one day it will be taken away. But until that time, God has no other choice except to allow sin to run its course through this world. God specifically told Adam, That on the day that he ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, death would be introduced into the world. And it would have serious repercussions. So now God is simply describing how sin is going to affect Adam and Eve and the world around them and all of their descendants. Now, let me show you why this is so important. If, If you don't understand the two different perspectives and you don't know where you stand... It can really mess you up in life. It can make you bitter towards God. It can make you turn away from church. It can make you say, if that's the way God is, I don't want to have anything to do with you. And usually it's because we don't understand this issue. So let me just explain why this issue is so important. And to do that, I'm going to use a recent tragedy from our own community. Several weeks ago been probably six to seven weeks ago. A very godly man passed away from kidney failure. Great person, great witness for Jesus. Invited so many people, not to our church, but the church that he attended. Was a wonderful witness in our community, and he passed away. Really before his time. You know, now that I'm 50 years old, I say at a very young age. Six weeks later, from the day that he died... His grandson had an aneurysm at nine years old and died. He died as a result of his aneurysm. Now, if you're a Calvinist, you believe that the boy's death was God's will. Why? Because Calvinists believe that nothing happens that's not God's will. That everything that happens is because God willed it to happen. And he's the cause behind the effect. If you're an Arminian, you believe that the boy's death was not God's will, but it's the result of living in a perverted world cursed by sin. Bad things happen because we live in this world that's been perverted by sin. So a Calvinist explanation of why evil happens in this world is because it's God's will. An Arminian's explanation of why evil happens in this world is because the world has been corrupted by sin. And God must allow sin to take its natural course until it's conquered, until it's condemned in the flesh by the Savior who's going to come. And therefore, God can, as a just God, punish sin in the flesh and reward righteousness. And because he's going to join himself with us in covenant, what's mine is his and what's his is mine. And he has made my sin. God condemns my sin in his flesh on the cross. He descends into hell with my sin. It's fully punished. God is just in doing so. But when all my sin is paid for, God looks into hell. He sees a soul that has never sinned. And he is able to legally and justly raise him from the dead. Now, we're still not going to see this completely played out until Jesus comes back. And when Jesus comes back, we're going to see. Jesus set his kingdom up on this earth. We're going to see things revert back to the way it was in the Garden of Eden. And then after that thousand-year period, the devil's going to be let loose for a thousand years. For a thousand years. He's, He's locked up for a thousand. He's going to be loose for a little bit. And 
a group of people is going to rebel against God again. And those people are going to be consumed by fire. There's going to be the great white throne judgment. This heaven and this earth will pass away. A new heaven and a new earth will be created. And we're going to live in eternity without any sin. Does that make sense? But it all goes back, people, to Genesis chapter 3. And your personal belief as to whether God was prescribing the curse, it's his will, or he's describing the curse, it's not his will. Let me say it again. It all goes back to Genesis chapter 3. And your personal belief as to whether God was prescribing the curse, in other words, he says, this is what the curse will be, or if he's simply describing the curse. Oh, Heaven and Eve, you don't know what you did. You don't understand the evil that you've allowed to come into the world. And I can't come in and just punish sin completely because if I do, you're dead. That's it. There's nothing. So I'm going to have to allow sin to run its course until the seed of the woman comes who is going to crush the serpent's head. But I'm getting ahead of myself. This is why I told you when we started the book of Genesis that Genesis is probably the most important book in the entire Bible because it, explain, it explains so much about our world. It explains the origin of sin, the origin of evil. It explains God and his character, God's plan for mankind, God's plan for redemption. All of those things are laid out in the book of Genesis. And if we don't understand those things as we study the rest of the Bible, if we've got a wrong perception of God, that's carried through in the rest of the Bible and in our interpretation. So I tell people, it's scary if you screw up Genesis. Because if you screw up Genesis, you'll have a screwed up perspective of God and you'll have a screwed up perspective of the world. And again, let me give you an example. If you believe that God is prescribing the curse in Genesis 3.16, you'll believe that man is supposed to rule over his wife. It's God's will. Woman, you submit. She knows I'm joking. <laughs> Don't you, honey? I was going to say I'm a figurehead, but no, it's a partnership. Now, why is the world so screwed up? Well, Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 11 and verse number 12 says that God gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. And we've been taught that that's the five-fold ministry. That is not the five-fold ministry. When you get to the last two, pastors and teachers, if you understand Greek grammar, there's something called the Granville Sharp Rule. The Granville Sharp Rule tells us the pastor is the title, teacher is his function. If pastors were what they're supposed to be, which is teachers, we wouldn't be messed up. The problem is pastors don't teach. And as a result of that, you don't understand certain things that you should to understand God, his character, and how he deals with the world. That's why it's so important for a pastor to be a teacher. Okay, that's your theology for tonight. Now let's go in a little bit more in depth. We're going to look at the curse itself, but before we do that, I want you to notice something that I think is very interesting. I want you to notice that the curse parallels the role of the woman. Eve was created to be a helpmate for Adam and the mother of his children. And the curse specifically affects those two things. Look at verse number 16 again. To the woman he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. So what was intended to be woman's main source of blessing, marriage and having children, is now tainted by the curse. What should be the two greatest blessings in her life, marriage and and children will be very difficult and even painful at times. If you remember when God created Adam, he looked at him and he said, it's not good for him to be alone. I will create a helpmate for him. We looked at what that word means. It means the opposite of. In other words, the same creature, but God made her completely opposite because man is incomplete. And therefore, woman was made to complete him. And they were supposed to walk in a harmonious partnership. Yes, the man would still be the head of the household, but it's a harmonious 
partnership of what took place. Because of what happened with sin, the two things that would bring her the greatest joy, which is her marriage and her children, now is going to bring forth pain. That's just simply a consequence of having sin in the world. And people, it is the same thing with Adam. His main responsibility was to provide for his family. But because of sin, providing for his family will be much more difficult than it was ever intended to be. And I want you to understand that work is not a part of the curse. How many of you have been taught that work is a part of the curse? Work is not a part of the curse. Adam and Eve were supposed to work before they ever fell. In fact, God placed Adam in the garden to tend it. In the Hebrew, it means to cultivate it, to take care of it. His job was to pick, pick the fruit. And when it starts to get overripe, he picks it, he destroys it, he prunes it back. He keeps it going good. He had a job. But then when he sinned, God comes to him and says, Oh, Adam, you don't know what you did. Because of sin, here's what's going to happen. By the sweat of your brow, through toil, you're going to work and sometimes you're not going to be rewarded. You're going to plant your fields and sometimes there's going to be floods. You're going to plant your fields and sometimes there's going to be drought. You're going to plant your fields and right before you're ready to reap, another nation will come in and they will destroy and invade your land. All because... You've allowed sin in this world. So in verse number 16, God is explaining to Eve the consequences of her sin, especially as it relates to her role as a woman. Now again, let me repeat, God is not placing this curse upon woman. He is simply explaining. He's describing what's going to happen as a result of sin being in the world. So let's look at the curse that came upon all women. First of all, the pain of childbirth will be greatly increased. Let's read verse number 16 again. And I want you to underline the phrase, greatly increase. I'm reading out of the NIV. To the woman he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain you will give birth to children. Now, that phrase, greatly increase, is translated from the Hebrew word rabah, which means to multiply. That's very important. Because God did not say that more pain would be added to childbirth. He said that the pain would be multiplied, not added. There's a big difference between it being multiplied and it being added to. Now, what does this tell us? It tells us that the pain of childbirth would have been very minor had the fall not occurred. It would have been an uncomfortable feeling at the most. A few minor contractions, the need to push, and voila, you have a baby. But now that sin's been unleashed in the world, the pain of childbearing is multiplied. Now, I don't know if it's five times greater, ten times as greater, twenty times greater than what God originally intended childbirth to be. All I know is that when they started allowing men to go into the delivery room, the number of children in the family decreased dramatically. I know that. I understand that. I know that when I saw what Lisa went through to have a child, I decided very quickly not to have more than two children. I couldn't go through that again. Two was enough. I went in there with her, and boy, the pains would come, and she grabbed my hand, and she was squeezing it, and tears were rolling down, and she was panting, and we'd gone through that stupid thing called Lamaze. Focus and breathe. And I'm going, honey, breathe. <sighs> and she's, shut up. No, she didn't ever do that. <laughs> My wife was so good. And boy, it was hours of that pain coming. And then finally, all of a sudden, the head crowns. And so I looked down there thinking, I'm going to see something amazing. And Mike had a 14 and a half inch head. My gosh! How can that come through? Oh, man. Do you realize that before modern medicine, before cesareans, that so many women died in childbirth, and the child did also? My mother-in-law's mother, she said when her mother went to the hospital, she knew she was never coming home, and she was 10 years old at the time. 
her little sister who was born and the reason why her mother died is mentally retarded because of the pain of the childbirth and how hard it was and how long it took and what they had to do to be able to get the child out and oxygen didn't get to the brain. She's now in a nursing home and she's what? Six-year-old mentality. And Maydeen's mom never came home. And that's the way it was until modern medicine came along. And even with that sometimes. And people, let me tell you, it was never intended to be that way. And I know God's heart was broken when he came to Eve and he said, Boy, you don't know what you've done. Because I must allow sin to run its course. Because if I choose to step in right now and punish sin, then you'll no longer be here. And a race of people there will never be and there will never be any redemption. But here's what's going to happen. Childbearing will be greatly increased. The pain will be multiplied. Now the faith movement has taught. How many of you have been in the faith movement? Go ahead, you can raise your hands. Anyone? How about the word movement? Okay, Lisa and I, we've been in the word movement. We go to church. And the guy would teach for an hour and 30 minutes. We'd take a 15-minute break, and he'd teach an hour and a half again. And we liked it. So when you gripe about me teaching for 35 minutes, it's like I tell my kids. When I was growing up, we had to work 12 hours a day, and we liked it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> now, the faith movement has taught and still teaches that women can be saved from the effects of this specific curse. In other words, a woman does not have to suffer intense labor pains during childhood if they have enough faith. Anyone heard that? My gosh. You good little people have either been always in my church or someone else's church and never really ventured out. And the faith movement and the word movement base their teaching on 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 15. If you don't mind, go ahead and go there. It's one of those weird little verses. Paul's talking about women, and he's talking about why Paul does, why he does not allow women, he does not suffer a woman to teach a man. And then he kind of goes into the role of the woman and how Eve was deceived first. But then he comes to the last verse in the chapter, and he says something that is so strange, and this is it. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with pro, uh, Propriety. How many of you have read this and thought, is he talking about if we have enough faith, we won't have to suffer a lot of pain in childbirth? Is that what Paul is saying? Is Paul saying that a woman doesn't have to suffer the intense labor pains of childbirth if she has enough faith and she lives a holy life? Is that what Paul is saying? Has anyone ever wondered that? Has anyone ever read the New Testament? Okay, has anyone ever read this verse then? Or do you just get your quota done and you don't even think about what you're reading? You know, I would think you women that's had children that you'd be searching for a way out of that after you've seen it or even experienced it the first time and then you get pregnant the second time and you go, oh my gosh, it's coming. God, help me. And then someone says, well, you don't have to experience that. Just turn to Second Timothy or First Timothy chapter two, verse number fifteen. Get that in your heart. Quote it. Have enough faith, and you will be saved from childbearing. So, is that what this verse is saying? What does this verse mean? Well, to be honest with you, it's really difficult to know what it means without a knowledge of Greek. Now, I hate saying that, and I'll tell you why. Because it gives the implication that you really can't understand the Bible if you don't know Greek, and that's not true. Let me just tell you something. Ninety-nine percent of the Bible. You can understand without knowing a smidgen of Greek. That's how clear it is, and the translations are pretty good. Now, I bring out a lot of words because I'm going to amplify the meaning and make it even clearer because I do understand New Testament Greek. That's my minor. I have over 30-something hours in New Testament Greek. I've had one year in Greek grammar, which is a complete year. The second year is syntax, the third year is exegesis, and then I had to go a little bit longer because I started all over on some of the majors, and you did exegetical readings which basically meant that you sewed up to class. He said, turn to Hebrews, and he'd tell you what chapter. He'd say, start reading in the Greek, 
And then he would say, okay, stop, conjugate that verb or decline that noun. Now, can I do that now? No. Because he told me when I left, he said, make sure that you use it every day or you will lose it. And let me just explain something. I didn't use it, so I lost it. Does that make sense? So I'm trying to kind of regain that back. But let me say this. Understanding the Greek helps me to understand a little bit deeper and to mine some things out in gold. But I don't want to give you the indication that you cannot understand the Bible unless you understand Greek. Because that's not true. But there are certain verses that if you don't know the Greek, you can't understand it. And this just happens to be one of those verses. But if you do know Greek, it's very simple to understand. And let me show you why I say that. First of all, I want you to underline the word childbearing. When will be, women will be saved through childbearing. Childbearing is translated from the Greek word technagonia. And it's a compound word that's made up of two words. It's made up of the word technon, which means child, and genomai, which means to, to become or to bring into existence. Now, when you combine these two words, it literally means to bring a child into existence. And that's why some of the translations translated it as conception, but that's not what it means. We're 2,000 years from that time, and so they made an error in doing that. It actually means childbirth. In other words, congratulations, you brought a baby into the world. You brought a baby into existence. Until that baby is born, it's not in existence in the world. It's in your tummy, it's here, but let me tell you something. When it comes out, you're so proud, and so is Daddy. You brought a baby into the world. That's what this Greek word means. Now, look back at verse number 15, and let's underline the word saved. But women will be saved through childbearing, through bringing a baby into the world. Let's say that again. But women will be saved through childbearing. That word childbearing means through bringing a baby into the world. If they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Now, the word saved is translated from the Greek word sozo, which refers to salvation, specifically spiritual salvation. Now, the word sozo simply means whole or complete. When man sinned, he was no longer whole or complete. He was empty of the spiritual part of it. He was spiritually dead. But when we're saved, we become spiritually alive. But God wants to do so much more. And many times we talk about being made whole or complete. And we include things in like healing and those type of things. And that's true. That's part of salvation. But the root part of salvation is referring to your spiritual salvation. You are born again. So that's the word that is used. Spiritual salvation. So I want you to notice what this verse is saying. It's saying that women will be saved, talking about spiritual salvation through childbearing. In other words, through bringing a baby into the world. Oh man, we're getting crazy here, right? No, 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 no. Here's where it gets very interesting. The word childbearing is singular, not plural. You see in Greek grammar... The suffix tells you whether it's singular or plural, and it's singular, not plural. So it's saying that the woman will be saved through a childbirth, singular, not through childbearing, plural. Not only that, but there's a definite article, the Greek word tastes, before the word, the word childbirth, which means that it's talking about one specific childbirth. Not a childbirth, but the childbirth. Ooh. Ooh. And can you guess what specific childbirth that Paul is talking about? The one specific childbirth? The birth of Jesus. He's going back to Genesis where we all saw it begin. Genesis chapter 3, verse number 15, the seed of the woman. So Paul wasn't talking about childbirth in general. He was talking about a specific childbirth, the childbirth that's promised in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. The seed of the woman, 
that was promised to crush the head of the serpent and to bring salvation to Eve and to all of their descendants. So the point that Paul is trying to make here in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, is even though, yes, Eve was deceived, and yes, she brought sin into the world. Go read this in context. That's what Paul is talking about. She will be saved through the coming of Jesus Christ, just like Adam, all, as well as all women who have faith. In fact, what Paul is actually emphasizing, because when he came in and said that he suffers not a woman to teach a man, in that context, he then doesn't want any, anyone to think that woman is a second-class citizen. So now he's going to go into, yes, Eve was deceived, and this is what happens. But the reason he ends on verse 15 is because he wants his readers to know, and they would have known because they read and understood Greek. That was the international language of the day and why the Bible was written in Greek. He wanted them to know that women play a very special role in salvation. Why? Because it's the seed of the woman, not the seed of the man, that brought salvation to us. It was the incarnation where Jesus was supernaturally conceived within Mary. And she fulfilled the promise of Genesis 3.15. And so, even though there's going to be this pain in childbirth, Paul looks back and Paul says, women will be saved, not through childbearing, but through a specific childbirth. The specific one in Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman that crushed the serpent's head and brings salvation to us. So women were not considered to be second-class citizens in the kingdom of God. Never have been. No. They are joint heirs with Christ just as men. And if we have a proper perspective of the book of Genesis, we can go all the way back. And we can look at how God designed it to be in the Garden of Eden. We can look what sin did and we can look at the curse and see that exactly what God said would happen has happened. You know, it's kind of interesting that if the Muslims actually come in and, and, and they get their law in effect, basically they can kill their wife, they can kill their daughters, for an honor killing. Sharia law. They, they're able to do that. They come in and, and, and women are chattel. They're property. Why is that? Because sin was brought into the world and we see what man does. Now, let's look at the second part of verse number 16 back in Genesis chapter 3. Go ahead and turn there. Let's read this again. No, we're not going to get to the man tonight, are we? Your desire will be for your husband, husband and he will rule over you. Underline the word desire. It's the Hebrew word teshuka, which means to desire or thirst for intimacy. It is a craving for intimacy. So that desire for intimacy within marriage is innate within women. Women crave intimacy with their husband. That's why they want to talk and share feelings. And that's why men, when they say, well, tell me how you feel, and you go, well, I don't know how I feel. Well, I feel kind of hot. No, not that kind of feeling. But you see, men don't even think that, think that way. But the reason women do is because they crave intimacy with their husband. But notice what God told women or told Eve about men. He, he said, but he shall rule over you. God created within man an innate desire to rule. The word rule is the Hebrew word masha. Masha means to rule, to reign, to exercise dominion by force. And the way that God created this within man is he, he placed within him a greater amount of what is known as testosterone, that hormone. And that's what makes man competitive and aggressive. And that's why men want to rule. But the reason God did that is so that he could provide for his family. But here's the problem. Because sin is in the world, now what God has created to be good has now become perverted. So now this desire to rule has now been tainted. And it's not the way that God designed it to be in the very beginning. In fact, everything that God designed to be in the beginning has now been affected. We've seen this as we've been tracing this through in the animal kingdom. God created all the animals to eat grass, to be herbivores, not to be carnivores. But what happened when sin was introduced into the world? That all changed. It perverted the way that God created to be. And we're going to look at this when we look at man and see what happened also to the soil and to the earth. And I'm going to show you why we have cancer next week. It all goes back to the book of Genesis. And it specifically tells us 
why we have mutations. Why we have what we do. Why we develop skin cancer. Why we get old. Why we die. Genesis tells us. But now that man has this sin nature, the desire to rule will not only override his desire for intimacy and cause marital problems, but it will also cause man to use his God-given strength for evil. And sometimes evil against his wife. And I've seen that. Men sometimes physically abuse. They verbally abuse. They can emotionally abuse. And women can do the very same thing. But I want you to understand, the reason that man is usually not the husband that he's designed to be is because we have a sin nature. We basically have to be transformed by the Word of God to become the proper husband material that you want us to be. But don't point your finger at us because you're really not the wife material that you're meant to be. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So now the very thing that wives you, or women you wanted, which was to have this great marriage and have these children, now you're married to a person and you guys fight all the time and you have children and you think, oh, we're just going to love each other. And they grow up to be rebellious teenagers. And so the thing that was meant to bring you the greatest joy is now bringing you the greatest difficulty and the greatest pain. But just look back at Adam and Eve and they caused it all. It's not God's will, but that's what happens. Can I finish one little thing? It won't take me five minutes. Three minutes. Let me ask you a question. Why won't we be married in heaven? Because the Bible tells us, Jesus made this comment. You know, when they came to him and they were tempting him and they said, you know, uh, the guy died and so his brother married. They didn't have children, so they died. They're talking about liver at marriage. Um, so the other brother married her. They still didn't have children. He died. So in heaven, whose wife will she be? Oh, they've got him stumped. And he said, you don't understand. He said, in heaven you're going to be like the angels. You'll neither marry nor be given in marriage. Now, we do know that there's going to be physical people. Remember, we talked about that if you were here through Revelation. It's going to continue on and they will populate the new heaven and the new earth. But those of us that are transformed, those of us that are raptured or are part of the second resurrection, we won't get married. Why? Why, Lisa, will we not be married in heaven? Man, you know, I, I just don't get that. And, and I, I, I've told Lisa this many times before. I think that's kind of a raw deal. But I understand why we won't be. Do you? Yes, very good. It's because we won't need to be. When God created Adam, he saw that it wasn't good for him to be alone, so he created a helpmate for him. This helpmate was created to complete Adam. The truth of the matter is, unless you've been given the gift of celibacy, you've been given the gift of being single, you're meant to marry because you're not complete without being married. That's why there's always a desire. Doesn't matter who you are, unless you've been given that gift. And if you've been given the gift to be, to be celibate, no one should pressure you to get married. That's a gift from God. But unless you've been given that gift, you're not complete. But the Bible tells us that when we are transformed, when we're raptured, or whether we die and then our body is resurrected, what's interesting is the Bible says that we're going to know as we're known. That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12. And then in, in 1 John chapter 3, verse number 2, it tells us that we are going to be like Christ. And because we're complete, we don't need to be married to be made whole or complete. And that's why we're not. But while we're on this earth, we need to be. But dadgum Adam and Eve, they allowed sin into this world. And so the thing that completes us, the thing that we need, also has many problems in because of the sin nature. Men are not the husband material they ought to be. Wives are not the wife material they ought to be. Or women aren't the wife material they ought to be. And therefore, we have to allow the Holy Spirit to work upon us. We have to learn the principles from God. Allow him to change us and become the husband and the wife that God wants us to be. And that's why I teach on marriage all the time.